The sea is blue and calm. In the still air of the early morning, it's good to take a few moments to watch the gulls rising effortlessly on the air currents as they sweep up from the beach below. They seem to spend hours just gliding along without moving their wings. Sometimes it makes you wish you too could fly. It looks so easy. But before we get carried away, let's pop inside for a cup of tea. Hello, my name is Peter John Cooper. Today's tale from the cliff edge comes from a time when people were earthbound, not only by the lack of technology, but by social convention and fashion, which ordered the wearing of unnecessarily difficult forms of clothing. It's called crinoline, and it's read by the estimable Eleanor Rose Cooper Crinoline Sitting was not a graceful activity when wearing a crinoline, so Emily did not sit. When out walking on the West Cliff, one could only progress in what she hoped was something akin to a ladylike waft, with parasols set at a jaunty angle and bonnet keeping the worst of the sun's rays off one's face. Altogether, the whole ensemble seemed to militate against ladylike progress. The heels on her boots caught in the grass and the heat under the heavy tartan material and layer after layer of silk and cotton petticoats was at time close to being insufferable. What's more, the crinoline was a (coughs) nuisance on the cliff edge. The slightest breeze would catch it and turn a lady hither and thither. In fact, she'd heard a number of tales of women who'd been quite lifted up in the air and deposited on the sands below. Or, more luridly as her brothers told it, who had fallen the 90 feet and had their brains dashed out. Had she not been promenading with her mother, she might have resorted to one or other of the words that her brothers occasionally used, although she had pretended to have closed her ears to them. She was annoyed that such useful words were not available to her. So she stuck to what she believed were ladylike pursed lips and the occasional tut. Do not tut, Emily, said her mother, so Emily could only express her feelings with a very quiet sigh. When her mother suggested she might like a promenade along the West Cliff, she might have demurred, except that she loved coming here to watch the birds soaring up over the cliff edge and gliding on stiff arched wings, occasionally flapping them and languidly flying out over the sparkling waters of the bay. If only I could be as free as that to soar and glide, she thought and sighed. Do not sigh, Emily, said her mother. It is not ladylike. In fact, she was fed up with the whole ladylike thing. It was no fun being a lady. She would rather have been an engine driver in a skate Bournemouth altogether, or an aeronaut in a balloon and sailed far out beyond the horizon to France. And how are your French studies advancing, child? demanded her mother as if reading her mind. And although being called a child might normally have caused her to tut and sigh even more, she brightened at once. I hope I have not wasted too much on employing Mademoiselle Dupont to teach you. No, Mama. Je suis. Tu es. Il est. Nous sommes. Vous êtes. 
ils sont, she rattled off. Excellent, exclaimed her mother, who had no French herself and might be hoodwinked thereby. But Emily was wise enough not to demonstrate quite how fluent she was in the language, in case Mama might think that the work was quite finished and send Mademoiselle Dupont packing back to France. And, in fact, this is where her plan to escape the stifling atmosphere of Bournemouth and being a lady was maturing. She had read several books on the subject of birds and flight, which she had managed to obtain from a certain circulating library through the agency of Mademoiselle Dupont. But the latest, Du Vol des Oiseaux, by Count Ferdinand Charles Honoré Philippe Desterno, held pride of place on her bookshelf in front of other improving works on etiquette à la Française, none of which she more than glanced through. Du voile des oiseaux held her enthralled. The amount of detail in the Count's observations of both flapping and gliding filled her mind with wonder. In fact, truth be told, she was a little in love with the Count, with the romantic-sounding name, and in her wilder fancies, she considered building a set of wings to the designs he set out and crossing that small strip of sparkling water that separated them. She would soar in the updrafts over the channel and then skilfully manoeuvre herself down to alight on the soft cliff-top grass near Cherbourg and he would be there to welcome her. At last, mademoiselle, someone who understands my own love of flight. Come with me and we shall fly off together to Moi Chateau to practice flying from the battlements. And even though she might have to be a bit of a lady then, it would be as a lady of the Lord of the Sky. And in the warm afternoon sun, she gazed hypnotised by the effortless way the gull rose up on the currents of air, how the shapes of their wings were echoed in the Count's designs. All it would take was a strong but light framework covered with some fine material. But where would she obtain such things from? Her brothers might do so, but she would not want to explain, and they would have to know, and help, and then take the project over, and then take off themselves to the waving of banners and the sounds of brass bands. No, she must do it herself. But how? And, in a blinding flash, she knew. She knew how to do it. It was so startlingly obvious that she could hardly contain herself, and in her excitement she said, Mama, il faut que nous rentrons chez nous. Her father's villa was one of dozens of other large buildings set in their grounds in what had been until recently scrubland between Bournemouth and the charming village of Westbourne. At the bottom of the gardens, hidden by a thick laurel hedge, was a number of greenhouses and potting sheds, some of which were quite unused. Thither she repaired and laid her plans. She did indeed have the materials to hand, and under the Darling Count's guidance she would soon have a set of wings constructed. All she would have to do was to get them to the cliff edge and strap them on and... And there she is, in the first rays of the rising sun, whilst the air is breathlessly still, and the light peachy and the sky is blue. Before anyone else in the laurels is awake, she straps on the wings made from fine whalebone and steel of the crinoline hoops, and stretched with the fine silk of her under petticoat. She removes her boots and, taking a deep breath, launches herself out alongside the gulls into the waiting arms of her dear Count. Although this was meant to be a story about optimism overcoming the shackles of earthbound thinking, when I first showed it to Eleanor, she thought the ending could be seen as being rather sad. So we've recorded something a little more positive on the end.
up to that point, she has not considered that she might fall and suffer the fate that her brothers had so lovingly described. But now there is a horrible realisation that this might be the case. Her heart lurches as she looks at the sands far below. Is this to be the end of all her hopes and dreams? And indeed the end of her? Thea grips her. But then a remarkable thing happens. The breeze strengthens. She can feel its sudden power like a great hand lifting the wings. And now, instead of falling, she is rising. Like the gulls spiralling round and round on the updraft. The gulls circle closer, puzzled by this intruder in their midst. But all too soon, the breeze eases and she slants gracefully down and lands a few yards from where she started on the short green turf. She is elated, triumphant. The count in his work is to be trusted. But she decides there is much to do yet before she can make it across the channel. She decides to keep her escapade to herself. Who knows what the future may hold? Taking her boots and hands, she makes her way through the still dawn light to breakfast. Thank you for listening to that, and a huge thanks to Eleanor for taking the trouble to read it. Have you ever wanted to fly? Why don't you build yourself a pair of wings and give it a go? Du vol des oiseaux by Count Ferdinand Charles Honoré Philippe d'Esterno was published in 1860 and apparently he had indeed cracked the problem of flight. See you next week. <laughs>